Uh, I'm in the land-based division, um, but I also work in business as well. Um, and I'm a lecturer and an advanced practitioner in the city of Then we'll continue um, going west with Ellie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Allie Davidson. I work at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, uh, and I work in our Educational Development Centre, which is under Teaching and Learning Services at Carleton, and my role is uh, supporting faculty in teaching and learning with e-portfolios in particular, and generally educational technology. Thank you. And uh, my name is Leslie Campbell, and I'm actually from South Surrey, so I had to cross two bridges to get here. <laughs> Quite a journey. Uh, I, I teach at Kwantlen Polytechnic. And in part of the School of Business, and I also am a faculty associate in their teaching and learning commons. And in that role, I support faculty with exploring e portfolio learning and uh, intercultionalization. So um, I've been part of the longest pilot, uh, e portfolio pilot in the history of the world, and Meg will be starting more. <laughs> and I'm Megan, and I also work at Fulton Polytechnic University. I'm a manager of learning technologies. I work in the PT Learning Center supporting um, the technology and infrastructure that we do for Fulton Polytechnic. Hey, and I'm Christina Höppner. We cross the Atlantic, we cross two bridges, <laughs> and now we are crossing the Pacific Ocean because I live at the bottom of the world in New Zealand. And I'm the project lead for the Mahara Open Source Project and also the community facilitator, and therefore kind of um, working together with all these lovely uh, women and many, many others around the world and supporting um, their use of e-portfolios and Mahara in specific, uh, specifically. Okay. All right. Nice. So we would like you just to kind of um, think a little bit about your biggest um, take two minutes, reflect on the questions that brought you to this session. Do you have a burning question about how you support this once you get down the road? If you're not involved in a project um, currently, maybe future plans. Um, just think about kind of the one burning question you have about how you would support this. And um, just maybe jot down your personal thoughts on that. And then we'll ask you to um, turn to, to your partner at your table and um, have a discussion about that. So just take two minutes to think on your own about uh, your questions about support. Okay, it's really been nice listening in on the, uh, on the, individual, uh, on, on the individual conversations. And what we'd like to do in the next few minutes is look at how the five of us support the institutions that we work at or the institutions that we work with in the use of e-portfolios and show you various ways. And then in the end, we'll come back to our intro um, activity for a wrap up and look at, well, do you find yourself there? Do you have other ideas that we might also like to try or everybody else here in the room? Because we've heard over the course of the conference already that sharing and collaborating is really, really important. And so we'd like to just engage you with that also in our panel while we are presenting. And the first up is Ellie. Hello. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, instructor e-portfolio support. So as I mentioned in my role at Carleton, I support faculty in teaching and learning initiatives with e-portfolios. Um, primarily I support instructors who use uh, e-portfolios at the course level for assignments, but I'm also involved in supporting faculties at the program level who are looking to integrate it as a program tool for both learning and um, so I thought I would give uh, some context uh, just to start, so you know kind of the institution that I'm coming from and the faculty um, that I might be supporting. So um, at Carleton, uh, we have about um, 4,000 students, 60 instructors, and 90 courses um, this past year that used uh, our, our e-portfolio system called CU Portfolio. Um, and uh, our system, CU Portfolio, is now an enterprise system. So we had a three-year adoption. We were comparing notes on who's had the longest uh, e-portfolio pilots. Uh, ours was three years. I thought that was long, but I think Juan <laughs> may take the cake for that. Um, so as of uh, 2017, uh, in the fall, we adopted CU Portfolio as an institutional tool. Um, so that's powered by Mahara. So all faculty, staff, and students have access to log into it. Um, so um, we have about 28,000 uh, students at Carleton. So this is a Fairly small number, but it's increasing adoption um, with, with healthy adoption uh, each year, it seems. Um, as far as support goes, so we have one full-time faculty, faculty support, that would be myself, 
We have one full-time student CU portfolio staff, so she's the person who goes into classes and introduces students to the tool and meet with them uh, if they need support. And we have one program assessment staff. Some of you may have met her already, my colleague Andy Thompson, she's here um, uh, at this conference. And so um, she and I work very closely together on those uh, uh, program level implementations of the ePortfolio, uh, where she's bringing her expertise on the assessment side and quality assurance side, and then I'm bringing my experience with the tool and also on the pedagogical side of the ePortfolio to support student learning. And we also have a working group. It's specifically a working group and not a committee, um, because committees are where work goes to die, um, from our experience. Yes. And um, the working group, we really titled it as a way to make sure that people who were involved in that are engaged in um, kind of steering the ship. And so that's very much a, a steering committee with engaged folks. Um, so going on, you'll have to excuse me for this layout. Just last minute, I changed something in the layout, and now my rubric looks very small, but you can you can actually click sense. on, um, if you go to the website, you'll be able to see rubrics on your own, which I'll still see too in a second. Um, so what does support look like for instructors? The typical experience for an instructor at Carleton who wants to use an ePortfolio would be to come to an introduction session at our educational development center that myself and my colleagues put on. We strategically put them in the summers and in times before, um, you know, when instructors are thinking about designing their syllabus. Um, during, so that's a half day workshop where they get a really broad overview, um, kind of more uh, theoretical about it, and then uh, learning about pedagogical kind of tips, and then they actually get to go into the tool. Because a lot of the draw for people to learn about the tool, I find, or learn about new portfolios is because they want to know what buttons to click, but I kind of get in there. So I said, yeah, I'll give you the hands-on introduction, but I'm going to put my pedagogical um, part at the start. And then um, I always encourage instructors after that workshop to have individual meetings with me um, after that because an introduction is not enough, I, I feel, with that broad overview. And, um, you know, sometimes one individual meeting is enough or I've met with some instructors, you know, seven to eight times in much more of an instructional design process where they really needed to map things out and work from a backwards design to make sure that the portfolio assignment is really clearly implemented. It just depends on the support of that particular instructor needs and we're really available to do that for them. We also have an online support site. Um, you can click on that if you're curious to see what that looks like. That's more of the technological uh, support. We also have community of practice meetings. Christina, can you scroll down because I just wanted to show a photo of that. So this is a little photo over, over here of a number of instructors at one of our community of uh, practice meetings. I started these in our pilot. Um, and they were actually monthly meetings, and we provided food, and they were very well attended, I think because instructors really needed the support from each other, because I still was kind of learning about what we were doing. Um, but then attendance started to peter out um, as people gained confidence, which is great. So what we do now is at the end of every semester, right around exam time, close to the end before people go on vacation, we get together, and that is a really informal um, time for folks to talk about successes and challenges of using the tool. We usually have a screen up in the background that you can see there, and instructors share examples of student portfolios, and it's a really wonderful time for um, professional development um, that's been peer support based. Um, then we also have instructor sessions so that they can learn from each other more formally in those type, panel type things. The other thing that we've done is we've developed rubrics for e-portfolio assessment. Um, so that was something in our pilot that we identified instructors had a really hard time with, was um, marking these authentic, um, really unique expressions of learning in the e-portfolios. And so um, I got together with another educational developer in my department and a group of faculty who were involved in the pilot, and we created e-portfolio specific rubrics, very much based off the AAC and U rubrics, and then from existing resources that we had. Um, so, you know, we have different categories like uh, creative thinking, reflection, organization, but for example, in the organization work rubric, the um, language is a lot more um, inclusive of different types of uh, modes, and it's not specific to writing. So that was a really great um, develop professional development opportunity for our instructors who engaged in that process, and it's now a resource to any new instructors um, who are learning about it. So, um, uh, 
the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a student support available. And I know that that's not specific to faculty support, but indirectly it very much supports faculty because we have that key uh, student support who is able to go into the classes and take the onus off of the instructors. Uh, so that was a really big deal to get the, uh, a fully funded position to have somebody um, take that responsibility off of instructors um, and help to reduce anxiety for instructors. Um, we also, okay, so for successes, what I would say, this used to say, this faculty engagement and enthusiasm used to say faculty buy-in, and I changed it um, as a result of the <laughs> keynote yesterday. Um, so I would say a success is that we've had great faculty engagement and enthusiasm. We actually created a peer support website, which has interviews with instructors who have used a tool, and um, we're interviewing them saying, what worked, what didn't work, what would you do differently, what advice would you have to somebody who's new to the portfolios? And so that's a resource for instructors to learn from each other if they can't come to the panel session that we offer or something like that. Um, I'll go through, let's see, we have um, some good program adoption from some, but not all, I'm sure kind of the same thing that lots of people are experiencing. Um, the other thing is because we started at the pilot, with myself as um, a fully uh, full-time uh, person supporting instructors, we're quite dialed into what's happening on our campus. Um, so I am regularly in contact with as many instructors as possible and trying to continue that community. So that's been really helpful for us to connect instructors for peer support um, and also for us to be able to get a sense of what's going on on campus and report back for you know, the funding side of things to say it's worth it. Um, okay, let's scroll down, we'll go to challenges. So um, the biggest challenge I think, like we've been talking about a lot at, um, uh, at this conference is the hearts and mind shift. Um, so one example that I have um, on the program level is we've had a few faculties who have agreed or who have um, started to use the portfolio um, in their program for both learning and for assessment. And you know you have some champions, some really keen people, and then you also have some people who begrudgingly take it on, right? They they do it because you know the majority voted on it, um, and it, we've had a real challenge with the folks who begrudgingly took it on because if you have one person in the initiative who's saying to the students, "Yeah, well, we just have to do it. I don't really see why," that really can sabotage. Um, so although we've had that healthy support. Um, from some faculty, if we don't have a consistent message from all the faculty to the students, that, that, that has been where my biggest challenge is to, to get everybody on board. Um, the other thing that we um, are working on is I am the only support staff for faculty and we're seeing a big take up in the tool, which is amazing, but um, I like vacation. Um, <laughs> so we're working on training one of my colleagues as a backup and I've been getting emails from her actually at this conference saying, oh, I met with another person. So that's really exciting that we're starting to build capacity to support uh, the scaling of efforts. Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, we'll be crossing the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. we're kind of this time around, we'll, we'll go a bit back and forth to make it more interesting and see different perspectives. And Louise will tell us about hers in Kent. Okay, so um, I'll give you a bit of a context the college. Um, I've been involved with Mahara as a college right since it started. I was an early buy-in. I said we have to have this. We've been working with it for five years. Every course I've taught, I've put the Mahara portfolios. I found a reason to use it, a legitimate reason to use it, and um, it's generally been quite successful. Um, I recently moved across to do more on uh, education teaching, so I'm teaching on teacher training, uh, postgraduate courses, um, educational studies, BA honours, and um, foundation degrees in supporting teaching and learning as a teaching assistant. The common link there is that all of our courses are um, they are in session for instructors, so they are working. It's a full time degree program, but they just come into college one day a week, and um, the rest of the time they are in employment, and that is a requirement actually of the course because we're using their experiences as part of the um, development that they're learning. So they, that has produced its own kind of challenges and I wanted to look particularly um, at the foundation degree in supporting teaching and learning. Whereas I've had pretty good um, feedback and success with Mahara, 
this group, um, they passed, but the student experience wasn't great when we did the feedback. And I thought, we have to go in and fix this. So what, where did that come from? What, were, what was going on? Um, so if we could have a look at, uh, we have a look at the first one, please. You can also try for yourself if you can. Oh, okay. Well, no, if you don't, let's take your word back. That would be amazing. Thank you, good team. Um, so it sure worked. I had good facilities and support through the technical side with our IoT. Um, the materials were fine. We had the experience and expertise <coughs> to run this. Um, but the students would find these concepts of portfolioing difficult. Uh, they kept wanting um, a framework. Um, they felt that there were more challenges and barriers, certainly than I anticipated and planned for. So if we have a look at what those challenges were, um, a lot of the group were new to higher education. Uh, some of them were new to the old uh, teaching assistant. So some of them had just started as teaching assistants, while others had got a lot of high level qualifications as teaching assistants. Um, some of them were new to equal equal programs full stop. So that was new ground. Others had used them in school. They had not used the hire. And um, nearly all of them were new to the external. So when I thought about that, I thought, well, okay, that's quite a lot of height to, to support right there. Um, and what I'm going to actually do is now to use this as an initial assessment tool. So um, thank you. the more boxes that the learners are ticking the, from that list of challenges, obviously their level of stress is going to be much more increased about dealing with um, everything related to the course. The particular unit we're talking about is a professional <coughs> practice portfolio. So they're cataloguing what they do, what, where they are now, reflecting on that, working it towards a professional development plan um, to move forward in their, in their degree, in their career. But it's really early stage, it's in the first semester of the first year. Um, so the responses I was getting, because I'm land based, I thought stress. What does stress look like? It creates uh, three reactions in the body. You either fight it, Slight, you flee away from it, or you just freeze. So I thought, well, how are my students responding? And the ones that were fighting were saying, why am I doing this? I don't want to use the portfolio. Can I use something I know? The ones with flight, uh, uh, they didn't, I thought they were on board after initial period, it just petered off. And the artifacts and the layouts were very basic, very simple. Uh, and the freeze, I was getting a few students who made very little progress. I, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then three quarters of the way through the course, they've done the work. And then there's a flurry of emails and requests. So I thought, what I need to do is break this down and analyze it and figure out what's going on. The ones that want to fight, um, they might need to definitely have clear course rationale, assessment transparency, very close linking with the graduate attributes, for example, um, use of technologies, communication, collaboration, the switch and um, to also work through the threshold concept with them, if you're familiar with that, that HE learning is disruptive, that you need to feel uncomfortable to move forward. Um, so all of those things need to be built into their program to support them better. The next ones, um, this was more about um, identifying support. So I felt that these students, we needed to take a different look at how we support them outside of the actual classroom or, or within possibly starting in the classroom, making sure that the right uh, specialist learning support was there. I've been reading research around the fact that some learners with dyslexia, for example, find the concept of Mahara, uh, and it possibly is other platforms, but in particular Mahara, um, more difficult, that the mapping is challenging. So I want to look at that more and work with, make sure that the <coughs> learning support assistants are aware of the platform so that they can support better to use mapping tools. Um, certainly working more, excuse me, working more with our ILT and LRC, that's an uh, information learning technologist and um, the library specialist, we've been putting in the bite size, um, so how to use Creative Commons, how to um, do different little aspects of, of teaching and um, using something called a viewpoint to plan and map when these interactions take place during the course. Um, working with other colleagues, uh, creating again the community of practice, we've been talking about sort of sharing common problems, and most important, creating that within the students. 
and using the, the social networking aspect of Mahara to create that safe space before they start um, committing to their own work and, and the assessed work. And then for the freeze, I used CATS model, which is what they will be using anyway as part of their learning development as training teachers. And that's accepting that you go through stages when you take off anything new. There is the survival stage, moving into consolidation, renewal, and maturity. And what that actually looks like when you are a Mahara beginner on the course. So mapping it, survival, really that reassurance, it's okay to fail. It's okay to be a beginner, to need an ask for support, emphasizing this with the learners. Then they can consolidate where they jointly explore, share options through renewal to maturity, but they become very autonomous and successful. So making that very clear. So then I built that into um, a framework, which I think oh, so this is further up. Yeah, um, I think it's higher up. Aligning of taxonomy. So, um, what I did there, and some previous research, I had mapped Bloom's taxonomy to Moon's reflective stages to see how that, that looked for using Mahara in particular through stages of CPD. But um, if we can just move right to the final column, I've now mapped that to an inclusive teaching strategy. And so, this kind of noticing first stage where it's um, on blooms, it would just be that very basic level, <laughs> demonstrating. Then you go to noticing, that's the noticing stage. That would be getting the initial assessment in for what the reflection, just what have I done, basically. And then all of these other things that I thought about in the fight, flight, and freeze are kind of mapped into the various stages against blooms and against the reflective cycle. And then I overlay that on my team of work. So that's where I'm picking out the different time points of when these interactions and when the interventions would occur. There's lots of other things in there, but I know I'm going to run out of time, but it's all in there. Thank you, Louise. And now we are coming back to Vancouver. <laughs> And Meg is going to talk about um, how to support ePortfolio implementations from the technology point of view. Me, me to drive? Yep. Okay. Um, so, a uh, lovely and I are sharing kind of two sides of the same coin. I want and I support kind of the back end technology stuff. And I just want to give you a bit of background about how we got to where we are. Um, many years ago, uh, some, some students in the design school came to me and said, we want a way to be able to like capture our stuff from course to course, like beyond the learning management system. We want a way to be able to have those artifacts and um, kind of share them from year to year and continue to work on your problem. And I thought, what a great idea! So that was that's what launched me into the world of ePortfolios. I started to do some research. We had recently adopted Moodle as the learning management system, and it's kind of discovered this kind of sister platform called Mahara that was really um, a good fit with Moodle. So we started, we threw it into a sandbox environment and uh, started playing around with it. Of course, those students, like students do and like we want them to, um, moved on and graduated. And so, um, but in the meantime, some, some seeds were planted in other areas. And one of them was uh, in the School of Business with Leslie and her human resources management program. And also our School of Health. Um, really saw an application for this, and uh, we had some champions in those areas, um, but they were largely doing this work out of passion and not the science of the best for many years. And we, unless we joked about it, we joked about it, it's kind of a joke, but <laughs> the world's um, longest running pilot, we started in 2008, we just kind of implemented things in a more formal way in 2016. So um, in quantum land, a pilot means that Basically, don't pay So, <laughs> um, so uh, you do things with people who are passionate about it. So that's where we were. The institution thought ePortfolio sounded like a good idea, but they didn't really know what that meant. Um, so people were reluctant to, to buy in or to try it because what support am I going to get? How do I know going forward that that support is going to be there? So we were in this kind of gray area for many years. Um, but then we, we managed to make a case, um, largely due to Leslie's efforts and showing some real results with the portfolios. 
um, and they were firmly embedded in the in MOSIS program. Um, so we decided to kind of um, make this a formal implementation. And that means that now we get a little bit of support. So it's supported um, by our service desk, so calls uh, from students and faculty can go through our normal channels for support. Um, we automated the account creation, so it used to be a manual process to create accounts for people that were there. Now you click a button um, from the learning management system, and there's a there's a screenshot of that uh, further down. You can look at that. So now it makes it easy for people. It removed that barrier. What do I have to do? I have to click a button to, to get started, and um, that was a big help. Um, the tight integration between Google and Mahara means that. Um, you can submit um, artifacts from Moodle to Mahara for assessment, which is um, a big plus. There's some pros and cons there, because um, like the session yesterday, um, Candace and Jean were talking about when you make things too easy for people, um, they kind of are able to kind of distance themselves from it. They don't have to invest in it. They just say, that's there for you students. You go ahead and do it. I don't really want to know too much about it. So making it easy is kind of a double-edged story, but it certainly um, removes that, that barrier for faculty that just want to look at the assessment piece and be able to do their assessment. Um, we have tried to provide student support through the Learning Center, and Leslie will talk a bit more about that. So students can drop into the Learning Center and get um, peer support. There's boot camps that they can go to get up to speed um, with that. Um, and so that is an ongoing process that we're um, working through and try to make sure continuity from semester to semester that um, that support is there for students. Um, we have uh, just in the works now, and I'm just going to tell us about it. Uh, we have a new custom theme for Mahara, so now it looks like you're in the same universe when you go from um, LMS to Mahara, so it makes it look like it's one integrated um, thing. We think that's going to be nice for students. Um, still on the wish list, uh, Leslie gets um, a quarter time release to do the support work. Uh, that works out to about 60 hours a semester. And she does like much, much more than that. So that the institution still really hasn't understood what that means in terms of support. So we need to push it up. We still don't have a clear retention policy. Like how long are we going to keep these things around? Um, because the pilot has, you know, it's historical, those policies didn't get them. And that's, that's a potential issue. Also, a transition plan when the students leave the institution, what happens to those portfolios? Their um, heart provides the ability to export to an HTML standalone file. You can set it up on the website. There are some sites out there. Um, we've talked about the Alumni Association and kind of getting involved and supporting, um, kind of hosting those um, portfolios after the fact. Or do we transition students to you know, a learning portfolio in their own discipline with whatever tool um, is popular with their discipline? So lots of things there to, um, to be worked out. Um, into the future, um, how do you scale this up? How do you address the technology questions about maybe one size doesn't fit all? Maybe there's a, um, you know, a way to kind of get students started out in a sheltered, supported environment and move them on uh, to build their portfolio in the real world with real world tools that they're going to use in their professions. How do you manage that? How do you support that from a technology standpoint? Um, we're starting to experiment in the bat, open badge space. So we've got a couple of initiatives um, with our um, HR department about employee training. Um, so we issued them a badge, but many um, employees don't have official presence when they have this virtual badge. So we're talking about the ability for employees to maybe have a portfolio space where they can um, post those badges and um, maybe discuss their career plans, capture the stuff that they can um, record their professional development. So that's the future. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. She's going to talk about the, um, there's some screenshots at the bottom of that page. There's a link to our help site. Uh, we have a help page. We have a forum where students can ask general questions. The biggest uh, support question for students is, I'm running up, up to the end of my quota. How do I increase my quota? Which is a good support thing to have to. And the reason why we just don't bump it up and let them have unlimited space is because it provides a really good opportunity to get in there and say, well, your quote is filling up because you've got like huge movie files attached to the thing. And there's a more efficient way to do that. And it gives us an opportunity to have kind of 
about a good management of moving assets. So I'll turn it over to Rusty. Yeah, I think we're a little bit behind our agenda. I'll have a very good time with you. We should stop about that. Um, so I, I would like to speak a little bit about faculty support and student support at a more micro level. The approach we use is very similar to uh, what you heard Sally describe, the difference being maybe the amount of time that we dedicate to faculty and student support at our two institutions, but we start with workshops and one-on-one -on -one follow up I wanted to share with you some of the observations I've made about working with faculty um, in um, introducing the ideal portfolio of making into portfolio learning. And one of the things uh, that I stumbled upon is there, there or, or I guess it's an erroneous assumption that I made. I made the assumption that people, our faculty, would really understand the reflection and be comfortable with that practice and that idea of the value of reflection. And that was, I, I had to really step back from that. And depending on the disciplines that I'm working with, even the word reflection had elicited reaction. And I was, I, I'm from the School of Business, and so it's changed, right, in the last 10 years. But I used to be, and I talked to faculty about the value but that's shifting and there's different disciplines where I think reflection practice has, has been longer part of the practice so they're more open to it but there is also the assumption that faculty under, you know, understood um, how to scaffold and develop and support students with um, developing their own reflection practice and I realized that I don't think that skill set is necessarily there so I have the, um, integrated that into our, into our workshop. So we introduced the concept of e-portfolio thinking. Um, uh, I, it's, I think it's really important that faculty work with the technology. I talked to them about developing their own street cred with their students and uh, a little bit of skin in the game, right? You ask your students to do something and you have not done that yourself. So as part of the workshops, I have been asking them to start working on their teaching e-portfolio. And um, I guess I meant to participate in a little bit of polio thinking of this, of this conference because I was really interested in what Melissa was saying yesterday in her workshop. Um, in the, with what you learned working with students, I think, was that when students first created a, a lower stakes e portfolio, they were, their higher stakes e portfolio was more complete, that it was deeper and better. And so I, I, I have shifted what I've done with faculty, where instead of asking them to start on their teaching e-portfolio, which feels big and hard, I ask them to start an e-portfolio that they'll use to connect with students. And I have developed an example of one that I use. If you can just scroll down, um, or, uh, so, yeah, and click here. So this is an e-portfolio that I use when I start to use when I work with faculty. Um, and it talks about my process of developing this e-portfolio and how I, you know, I, and I use the purpose of this e-portfolio is to introduce myself to my students and who I am, what my identity is as a teacher, which is what e-portfolio learning is really about. And the process I went through, it started here, I think that's a napkin actually in a bar, so, <laughs> where is some of the great thoughts began. And <laughs> I moved from there. And this is a work in process. So that's the other side is that, um, um, if you go to the second and third and fourth page, I, I, I had to think about how I wanted to represent myself to my students as an individual, as a professional, and as an instructor, and what I wanted to share. So there's some pieces that are missing, and I'm still developing them. And I have found that faculty are much more comfortable starting with this e-portfolio. And as they do it, they start to understand what happens when students create e-portfolios. Right? So it's been a really important shift for me. And I know we're way over time, that's more than but I'm going to turn it over to Christina and, uh, um, and let her wrap up with um, the heart of our community support. Thank you, Leslie. And now we've, we've looked at individual institutions. We're uh, starting with Louise in, in the UK uh, and uh, LA, looking at student support and then moving into faculty support, technology support. And what I'd like to look at is now, well, what can we as so, uh, the actual developer community of the softwares that people are using can do to support all those organizations. And um, that is where the community comes in, but it is not just limited to the 
to the people who developed the e-portfolio software, but kind of also incorporating the, the ABLE community, and in my case also quite extensively the Australian and New Zealand community through e-portfolios Australia, then we've got the communities over in the UK and in Europe and so on. And so what can we actually do in order to support all those initiatives and to make sure that the institutions have the tools available that they actually need to support that. Because yes, we've said we are going from a paper-based approach to an electronic portfolio, but what does that mean? What does every institution need? And you know yourself that um, people use things differently. People have different demands on the technology that is available to them. In um, Leslie's case, the portfolio might be used quite differently from health sciences. And then we have education portfolios, uh, teacher registration portfolios that again look differently. So in that community, the first important thing is to ask questions and to ask what do you actually need? Because we can develop the software from morning to evening, but if nobody's using it, why actually develop the software? So we do need to be purposeful and do need to develop the software in a way that it actually fits um, what people want. And that then means don't just ask the questions, but also discuss all the topics. And um, like Ellie said in the beginning, oftentimes kind of people get into the technology side of things, but it is more than that because the developers can solve the technology. Uh, what they can't solve, and also on my end, who's not a developer that kind of works with the team, we can't solve all the pedagogical questions because we don't know all the contexts. We, we know anecdotal evidence and we've worked with different organizations and we know what they need, but that doesn't mean that, 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 doesn't mean that your requirements are met or somebody else's. And so we do need to take that bird's eye view and look at all the things and therefore discuss things with the entire community, involve everybody in the discussion so that we can see, well, what model fits, what does Canada do, um, does that also help what the UK needs and vice versa? So bringing people into the conversation and then also involve the community in the UX. Because again, we have different groups. We have students using the software maybe when they are six, seven years old and we've got professionals in their full career and they have different demands. And so involving everybody also kind of really in the development of the software, not really through coding or through writing documentation necessarily, but just by being members in the community and answering questions, um, twiling things, giving them something quickly once we've made a development and then saying, yes, this works for us, can continue like this. Because you all know that students and faculty find mysterious ways of using technology that you might never have ever dreamt up um, when you introduce the software to them, simply because they are creative. They, they bend the programs to what they want them to, to do. And therefore, you might discover a really cool way. And then that can go back into the software and make the life of people easier. And um, then also connect on social media. People oftentimes have devices these days, not everybody uses the same platform. So we, we are on multiple channels. We have discussion forums, we are on Twitter. There's, there are several Facebook groups, there are individual discussion groups for countries where people can connect so that they also don't just have the big community, which is worldwide, but also smaller ones, because sometimes you just need to discuss Canadian issues or you need to talk about um, UK problems or New Zealand questions because frameworks are different. The educational systems are different, terminology is different. And sure, you can try to negotiate that in a wider community, but oftentimes it's just nice not having to explain yourself all the time. And um, therefore, making use of all those channels to connect, because not everybody likes to write a forum post or report a bug, but when I see things on Twitter, for example, then I can put that in, or we can start a discussion there that I'm then taking over into the wider community so that they also see everything there. And last but not least, share success stories. And that's also where the wider ABLE community, for example, comes in with this conference. We need to bring out the stories of how people use the technology and in particular um, portfolios from the pedagogical side, no matter what technology is being used. Because 
you can kind of envisage what or see what people do. And then if you have a particular system already, think about, well, how could I do that in my context? You don't all have to be on the same technology. And so it's really fantastic to have these gatherings here where we are not really talking tech, but where we are talking about the pedagogical side of things and support each other and share ideas no matter where we are from and also what we are using or in which area of the university we are working with. And that really helps in order to further the idea of portfolios and also find new avenues if you've been at ABLE for a number of years, you've seen that discussions have changed, topics have changed. There, one year there was assessment was the primary focus, and another year then it was learning portfolios, and people kind of steered away from the assessment again. Reflection became more important, uh, more importantly discussed. At other times, it might have been technology. Uh, two years ago, we had badges quite extensively represented at the conference. And so these things change, and being at the conference and discussing these with everybody um, helps to understand, well, where are institutions moving? Are these avenues that we should also be exploring? Or is there anything else? Um, if you do like to take a look, I've put some of the resources in here that we have in the community. Um, to support everybody who is part of it and the different channels that are being used at uh, the different language communities in some cases as well um, because not everybody is a native English speaker um, or is comfortable communicating in English themselves maybe receptively but not productively and um, so we try to make those things available and also support people around and um, that means anybody can contact anybody um, even if you're not in the Canadian group Ellie's very happy to still discuss things with you. Um, and also you can go to conferences, or if you're an ABLE member, you can also go to the conference in the UK um, or to Australia, because Australia during your winter is pretty nice, since it is actually during summer there. And so things like that, find the connections, make it um, happen and connect with people that are beyond your regular purview in order to see what's happening and um, then can get started. And that now leads us into our wrap-up activity, yes. for which I'll hand over to Meg. Yes, so those questions that emerged from your discussions, um, were there things that we didn't cover that you'd like to ask any of the panelists about or um, explore a little bit more depth? Um, we're happy to, to answer your questions by email and continue the discussion online, but we'll throw it open so that any of those Kim? Um, well, actually, a general question. Are there institutions among you folks here that are um, have embedded e-portfolio into particular courses or course areas? Here we have all of our English 100 courses now on that e-portfolio. Is that a better practice that's being adopted by other institutions so far have you seen that or? well I, I it's a huge I guess what I'm asking yeah. is it's a huge or suggesting it's a huge help to an instructor in other areas looking at bringing in e-portfolio and not having to instruct my students in a paper is that a common practice but or not well in the program I teach it's embedded in the program so every course has yeah. an e-portfolio component so I agree 100 percent when you have a program that's one of the advantages of programming portfolio is that people go up that learning curve and they can apply and their portfolio has become um, more expensive and, and deeper and, and uh, so they more valuable as they progress through the program. So that is why we I, you know, start with the supporting people individually in the courses with the hope or dream and trying to move to program portfolios because that is, I think, where you start to see real substantial benefits. Does anyone do anyone that the back people want to speak about what they're working on? I know. We have a representation at a table here from KU <laughs> who started to work with these portfolios in the pathway part and in, in, in a particular course um, looking at using e portfolio. So we're, we're going down that path. Yeah, I mean, we're really in our infancy and we're yeah. going to um, start our pilot project this upcoming fall. Um, and I have a question um, around. Final summative assessment. We're really 
really struggling with that and some um, faculty believe that it's impossible to do and others believe that it is possible to do. So I wonder if anyone has experience with that. So summative assessment, um, just in terms of perhaps a particular program, but also summative assessment for the purposes of graduation. Yeah, the course I've described is that portfolio that they submit, we lock it down, they submit it through um, Moodle. So if they're horror pages, they turn into collections, collections then put into Moodle, and that is what they are on that they grade that in their thinking. So have you had received any feedback from instructors or have you done it yourself in terms of how long summative assessment needs that final summative assessment? What is they need ongoing, yeah. so they're building that portfolio throughout the semester and at the end of the course they have it in the smart thing in the And do you use a rubric? Um, uh, only against the learning outcomes, how they need to know. So the university has a, a general um, rubric, so it's it's not on the portfolio oh. construction, it's on how much they're reflected, how they recognize the work. Okay, and so is, is it assessed by the individual instructor or is yeah. there a panel of I experts? I assess it, uh, but it's also then um, moderated by other people. Okay. And then I'm going to switch your space and let's look at next about what the models and the assessment that's being made for the state of that next one year. Oh, that would be for you. So this is your model and the individual. There's not a little bit of what these have to be, and they get to revert to the summit. Perfect, thank you. And uh, we forgot to mention the first of four, so people get mystery gifts. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to make a comment about the assessment piece, because I think assessment is something that faculty always struggle with. I'm actually director of faculty development, and we're not using a lot of these portfolios in the context of for the assessing the portfolios, but the notion of using the portfolio can also be as a learning activity. So if you think of the portfolio, and again, it's not always an either or, but for the students to create the portfolio or to create any piece of work with the reflection in, that's the learning activity itself. And then putting it into the portfolio allows that reflection. Now as faculty, you can be assessing each piece of work along the way. By the end of the portfolio, it's not that you have to start reassessing, but it's just, it's either done or it's not done, and it's done really well, like the whole collection is there, or it's not there. So if you do want to give a grade for completeness at the end, I think that's a good approach. But in my work, I kind of like to think of it as a reflective activity for learning. And I've also started doing it with faculty to get them thinking about their learning. So in the new certificate course that we've developed, all of their learning tasks that they do throughout the whole semester go into their portfolio. I don't mark that at the end, but I have them in for a consultation where we reflect and discuss. So it's like an oral assessment for learning. So I think it's, this is the mindset about how can we use portfolios for learning? How can we use folio thinking that um, might be able to expand it beyond just I've got a market for a grade this person has a prettier picture than that person. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to throw well, that I don't want to mark it on a, a portfolio rubric necessarily. Yeah. But on the, the, the learning outcomes. Yeah, they've met the learning outcomes. So how does your portfolio show you've met those learning outcomes? And let's have a conversation about that. It's kind of interesting. We have time for one more question. There are still mystery prizes. <laughs> <laughs> Now that I can't tell self-directed learners, workload, which you approached was release time, um, training, which you approached, uh, you didn't talk about your happy workshops next time you know, you're into that. Multimodal assessment, which is really difficult. It's not a flat paper assessment anymore, right? Um, and then uh, the other thing I had is happy for what you to learn. So you covered all of our... <laughs> well, that deserves, yeah. that deserves a mystery prize. That definitely deserves a mystery prize. Sure. Comment. I just have been enjoying watching the, the time stamps on the oh. updates on the presentations. Oh. <laughs> yeah. How very um, post secondary educator is. Like, this one at 3.48 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Outside of regular hours, maybe. Right. <laughs> so, 
So this will remain up there, and so this is another advantage of having a place to collect all the resources, and then at the end, it's all there. You don't have to collect it and put it somewhere. That was my question. Can we go back to the tiny URL again? Yeah. 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 Not even those were able to access it. Yeah. So I it's, pub it's public. Yeah.